Welcome everyone. Tonight we have an action-packed and exciting evening planned for you. Tonight I have Esther Konsikow hey, from XMD Academy with me. <laughs> Esther is an amazing illustrator. She has some fantastic things to show you tonight. We also have a special guest and master instructor of XMD Academy, Spicer McLeroy. Oh yeah, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to go over our agenda real quick. We're going to do some portfolio reviews. We uh, we had what, what, like over 100 uh, portfolio reviews. Um, well, over 100 submitted. We're going to go over just a few. Uh, so we don't run out of time. Um, and Esther is going to give an amazing demo for you. And we're going to take questions as we go. So. Uh, Without further ado, my pleasure to introduce you to Esther, the one, the only amazing XMD instructor for illustration. So everybody give it up. Woo, Esther, woo, <laughs> woo. <laughs> oh, yes. All right, uh, let me just, can I start sharing my screen? Yes, you can. Okay. You have the calm. All right. Okay, can, can everyone see my screen? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so I'm going to get started with Mudira. Uh, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. And I just want to go over a few things here. First of all, I think that your style is really cute. It reminds me a lot of a... Uh, it says here that you're also an illustrator and uh, you can also see here that you did some book illustration and it has more of that style that is more focused for children. And uh, that's pretty evident here and that's really good that you're showing this in your portfolio. So yeah, and uh, I pick one of uh, your pieces of artwork to give you the feedback here. Uh, and I wanted to point out just a few things that you can uh, include in your work to enhance this uh, just a bit more. It's, a, it's already good as it is, but it's just a little, just a few tricks. Um, one second. Okay, so the first thing that you have to consider before you start uh, your painting is to think of the composition. And that involves like the color schemes, the, the, the values that you choose. So something that I noticed here is that uh, you have to consider that the main focus is the red panda, but the background has this highly, uh, the value is almost at 100%, pretty much at 100%, and it's way too bright. Hey, Esther, I think you're you're not sharing your right screen. I think you're sharing the window. Oh, okay, let me just go to my Photoshop. You probably need to unshare and then reshare. Oh, okay, can, can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So one thing that you, okay, so the focus is the red panda and uh, something that I notice here is that the background is a, a just a little bit too distracting. It's just the value is way too high and the focus is mostly the red panda's face and uh, try to think this way. Imagine if this was a like a lake and you throw a rock into the lake uh, and imagine as if your the rock represents your focal point, and as the waves they expand, the last detail you're going to add it to your painting. I learned that with one of my structures uh, structures a while ago, and that was a, a a great way for you to keep in mind where you should focus your details and the attention. So I did a painting here. It was just a quick paint over just to get to the point. So 
what I did over here is I used the darken uh, layer. I picked this valley right here and I tried to bring a little bit more of balance. And uh, I also noticed that for the shadows here, you use, and that's something that you have to be really careful when you when you're painting the shadows make sure that you're not using uh a color that goes towards the black you know like the shadow side has a a little color in it so make sure you get rid of it just a little bit and i understand that the red panda has the, the one of the local colors from for the paws is actually black but still like you gotta make sure that you don't mix that with the shadows i added a little bit of the color dodge layer just to bring just a little bit of that warm feeling from the skies and also i don't know if you noticed but i just removed this uh thing right here it just it just felt that like try to see like this uh look for for this piece from far away and try to squint your eyes if it, it, it you can notice that it's a little bit hard to read what that exactly is you like it's hard to see if it's a if it's a piece of branch or a, a little mushroom so i think it would be better if you removed it and probably added something else in here that is easy to read um and also one more thing, uh, a suggestion that I have for you is to pick a layer uh, and put put it all in black. You switch and then switch the the layer mode to color. Then you go ahead, you go over here on posterize, and you can get to see things a little bit more simplified. So. If you can, if you're able to understand what is going on in posterize like this, it means that your values are working. So I always have this with me when I'm doing my painting. So I'm always keeping track of if the painting is, is uh, easy to read or not. So as you can see here, also another thing, uh, on posterize, you can actually edit here how many levels of you can have of uh of values so i started at let's put it as three and as you can see in yours there's like too much detail here going on and when we remove a bit of the details from the background you can see you can your focus go more towards the red panda and uh so yeah, like seriously, a uh, great job. I really like the direction that you're going. You know, it's evident that you, that, uh, you know, if I go to your art station, it's evident that your focus is on a children's book. And, uh, and yeah, just keep on going. Now I'm gonna go to the next one. One second. So this is a portfolio from Josue Calle. And I think, you, uh, can you guys see my screen? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. And I think your style is really cute as well. You see that your style is uh, very unique. You like to draw the like very cute animals with big eyes. That's really nice. I really like it. So, and also I'm going to go ahead and uh, I picked this, I picked this one for the feedback because I thought, I think it looks like really cute. And I just wanted to go over a few things. Here. So for this one, I um, just flip the canvas. For this one, I I will, I'm going to mention the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So 
as you can see here, I did uh, uh, a few modifications that they were a bit similar to the prior feedback, feedback I gave. Okay. So you have the the CU in here, and uh, however you can, you have a lot of space here that it looks kind of empty. And because of the the brightness of the background, it's kind of hard to see the silhouette of the CU. You see what I mean? So if you squint your eyes and look for far away, uh, it gets a little bit hard to read what's going on. So what you can do is to like. So for this feedback, I tried to keep the, the, how can you say, the essence of your painting. And uh, I tried to keep a little bit of that brightness from the background and I added a little bit of snow. It, it's a little bit rough, but it's just for you to get an idea of the feeling of what, what I'm talking about. Then I darkened a little bit the, the background. I used this tool right here to, the gradient uh, tool in order to bring this effect. Then I used uh, Soft and Smooth brush and I added a little bit of brightness behind the seal. So if we go over to Posterize and we compare the both of them, you see on yours we have this, uh, like I said, the silhouette is a little bit lost. You see a bit of the features of the face of the seal, but the silhouette is, is still missing. And by darkening the background, you can see the shape of the seal. And also it doesn't look as empty as before because you have this element here, the snow. So you're going to bring that. Uh, so it looks a, a little bit more natural, you see what I mean? But yeah, always keep in mind, like uh, always focus on the composition first, like think on uh, with, uh, try to think uh, with big shapes first, instead of going ahead and starting, you know, very close to the canvas, just go ahead, keep it, keep a, a, lar a larger distance between uh, the computer and your eyes, so it's easier for you to work on you know, so you can see the big picture of the composition. All right, we're gonna go over the next one. Uh, one second. And that's the work from Sherry's uh, Pope. Sorry if I uh, uh, said your name wrong. So first of all, I, I really like what I see here. You have a little bit more of, you have a little bit of a diversity here. You have human art. Uh, you also have uh, some animals here, uh, illustration and uh, you also have some fan art. It's good to have a, a, in your portfolio a little balance between uh, you know, different things, but at, at the same time, keep that consistency. So when the client goes and sees your portfolio, they know what type of work that you mainly do. So that's really good. I really like this one, the colors that you pick. That's really nice. It's really pleasing to look at it. This one is really cute. I like this storytelling here. That's really nice. So I decided uh, for the feedback, I picked this piece right here. And I'm going to explain here what I, what are the changes that I've made. So. Again, it's uh, the same issue that the others, and I want to reinforce that because I see a lot of art, young artists doing the same, uh, the same type of mistake, and and it's pretty much uh, not thinking through uh, the composition 
you know, so the comp like when you plan, uh, when you build your composition, like, you know, just keep it loose, you know, uh, start with the bigger shapes and then you, once you have the whole composition ready, then you can go ahead and work on the details because what matters is what people are actually going to see is the big picture. And then details, they're just going to complement uh, the whole composition. So uh, if we use post-polarized, post um, we, we see that, uh, that the, sh the shape of the, uh, I forgot the name of this character. It's from Avatar. Uh, I just forgot the name of the animal, but the silhouette of the of his silhouette it's a little bit lost so a appa is that what it's appa? Called? Appa? yeah something like that yes so okay appa you see the appa silhouette is a little bit lost and on the and also a little bit of the shapes here gets a little bit confusing you see right here it's hard to identify what is going on here. Like from here, like in this area, it's fine, but I think that we can reinforce the, you know, the reading of this painting a bit more. So so I did a, again, this is just a rough painting, paint over. So what I did here is I picked the, a soft brush and I use the color dodge layers right here. I put it on the most saturated color and I just put it over here. And that's the that's the result that you get of this warm color. And you have to remember that depending on what you're painting. Let's say like during the daylight, uh, avoid, uh, okay, so if it's daylight, avoid using uh, a color that is 100% white. Remember that it has to have a little bit of, uh, a little bit of color. So on the light, you're gonna have that color transition between uh, you're gonna have the color transition between the light family and the shadow family. So you're gonna have the darkest of your light and the closest that the plane is facing the light, it's, it, it, you know, it starts to get gradually lighter. So you want to have that transition, make sure that this transition is, uh, you know, it's, it's visible. See what I mean? So on this one, we don't have that many variation of colors going on. So make sure that you gradually build towards, you know, the light and, uh, you know, pretty much sliding through the color wheel. So you have a little bit of a more interesting thing going on in here. And also as for the, the mountains here in the back, on the original one that you had, it's just uh, like, try to think of the rule of thirds. Like this one is just a little bit way too low. So what I did here is I brought this up just a little bit and I wanted to bring a bit more of that dynamic to the painting. You can like, you know, later on, you can add other details. This is just a, a quick demonstration just for you to visualize what you can apply in your painting in terms of fundamentals and things like that. So always pay attention to the flow, you know, avoid making things look, you know, straight or, you know, painting something that is right in the middle. Or, you know, if you're gonna uh, add the background, make sure that it's not just a plane or, you know, that is way too low. Try to bring that uh, harmony and also 
to, to make it look more dynamic. And again, like really great work. I really like what you did in here. Uh, I I don't watch this uh, cartoon, but I always see a lot of people doing fan arts of him. And I, I think he's the cutest. All right, let's go to the next. Jerry had a question. She said, uh, how do you decide where the flow goes when putting in backgrounds? Yes, you have to decide that way earlier during the process. You know, uh, usually what I do, and also one of the easiest methods for you to start building the composition is to go ahead and uh, work, start working with values first. So, because you got to make your show in the wrong screen. Oh, sorry. One second. Okay. So let's say like this. So uh, the main reason why you're going to start using values is because uh, values, they don't really need color in order to, to bring the idea of the composition that you're working on. So let's say that you have to like, uh, first of all, pick your values, like the value range. So you determine like, uh, so you have like, you know, so, so you don't have to use like a value that goes from here to from zero to one. It's good that you keep it in control. Let's say that, okay, th just for, the sake of it, I'm just going to do a heart just to get the idea across. And you have to make sure that on the black and white composition, this idea is uh, is readable. You know, because if it's re easy to read over here, then on your painting version, then you don't have to worry about how the composition is going to look later. So, And the same thing goes for the background. You want to, let's say, add a... Uh, some mountains, then I'm gonna drop the, the value just a little bit, just to indicate that the lighter value is in front. And then the medium value is behind the brighter value. So I'm gonna have, add some tree branches here. There's just like a really uh, simple explanation, but that's the way that I that I work that I highly recommend you guys to try it out. Just start from black and white. And uh, from there, you know, once you have the whole composition ready, then you can start working with the colors. Just need to share here. Uh, So for the next one, it's going to be VJ. And uh, I think that you have a really interesting portfolio here. I like uh, your illustrations. You can get the likeness pretty well. I like the colors and the, also the brush strokes that you added here. It's really good. So for this one, I, I didn't do the paint over, but because like the same uh subject that i was talking about with the other uh with the other art pieces is going to be it's going to go for the same one you see like you always have to think where you're going to have your details uh put on so uh you're gonna you have here a family of birds but then you know all the colors are overly saturated there's a lot going on with the details so what I would do is, like I did with the other ones, I would make sure that this would be the, my brightest point and I would bring this gradient effect right here from uh, darkness to lightness, you know, from top to bottom. 
in order to bring our eyes focused he right here on the birds. Also, I have a suggestion for you because, and also something that you guys have to pay a lot of attention. So, uh, if you, okay, so you have here that you're a concept artist, but most of the work that I see here is mostly illustration. So let's in, you just have a little bit of concept art over here. Like, I think this would be the best example of concept art that you have in your portfolio. So uh, if you just make sure that you, uh, you know, if, if you're go really going for illustration, make sure that you put that on your, you know, written in your portfolio. I just think that it's just missing a little bit of that. Uh, you also have some cool uh, 3D work in here. But again, it, it's the same thing. You, you got to make sure that if you're a concept artist, add more concept art. Same thing goes for the 3D, you know. Uh, but yeah, so that, that would be my suggestion for you. But yeah, good work. Uh, so for the next one. Uh, so her name is Britt. So first of all, I really love what I see here. Like, I think you have a really good foundation uh, on your work, like anatomy and uh, the flow of your line work is just amazing. It's very loose. Like I see that you have a lot of confidence on your line work and that's really good. I really like this. It looks very clean, very sharp. That's a really good work. And something that I, uh, but there's something that I, I feel like that is missing a little bit. And uh, I noticed that you like to paint a lot using, like you, you repeat a lot the color and the value palette in your work, like most of them, as you can see here, like everything is mostly like really dark. That's okay, but what I like, you know, for portfolio, I would highly recommend you to add different uh, color themes. So to look a little bit more interesting, like something that you did over here, it's pretty nice. I like the colors that you added in the background, very colorful. And also one thing that I noticed is that there's something about your line work that you, you, you how can you say, it makes it, like if you're drawing with a clear be background, your work stands out a lot. You know, you already have that line work that, it, it, you know, it's very sharp and I think that it works great if you have, a, 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 you know, a white canvas. So I would definitely recommend you like try to explore a bit more of this concept. I, I think it looks amazing, the design and everything, you know, and explore it, like I said, different uh, color palettes, like, you know, instead of going every time for a, a really dark background, try to add something with a clear background, uh, just so you can explore different possibilities and see what else, how much you can push uh, your art style, you know. So yeah, this is really good work. Good job. Now we have uh, Taina Martins. This is really nice. So Taina, something that I noticed is that, uh, that you have some really cool artwork here, but something very important uh, that I have recommend for you is to try to uh, avoid having just a little bit of artwork because you know, uh, when a client's going to check your stuff, they're going to see, they're gonna want to scroll down everything that you have in there. So always make sure that, you know, you always keep your portfolio full of, you know, content and different things. And uh, another suggestion that I have for you that I noticed in this one, but first let me just point out what I like here. Like, I really like these neon colors and uh, it looks, uh, it has this like cosmic uh, vibes, you know, you have planets and things like that. I think this is really cool. Uh, but I would 
try to maybe adjust this pose a little bit. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you heard of the term contraposto, but as you can see, like everything is facing the right direction. And uh, I think it would be great if you could bring just a little bit more of balance into the scene. So maybe if you turn the wolf's head to the left, you might have a little bit more of a contrast. You see, because his face is all white and the contrast with the white head against the dark background would enhance the wolf's silhouette as well. So, uh, and also, also pay very, a lot of attention of where you put your brightest uh, values. Like again, like you have the moon here, it's just really bright and uh, it's taking the attention away from the wolf right here. So always pay attention to where you're gonna put your brightest values because that's what is going to lead the viewer's eyes into the, you know into what you want them to actually see. Yeah, I really like this one. It's like it's really easy to read your drawings. Like you can tell what is going on, you know, in terms of storytelling. So that's really good. That's really nice. All right, good job, Kaina. Uh, let's go for the last one. A second. And that is uh, yet work. I saw that you joined one of my contests. <laughs> I really like this. The flow is just amazing. You have this S curve. You know, it starts from big and it goes really and starts to go a little smaller here towards the tip of the of the lion's mane. That's really awesome. Also, you know, for the portfolio, it's really good that you add the process of how you executed executed the piece. You know, uh, that's what a lot of clients like to see is how you got to the final result. You know, it shows that you have skills for being like a concept artist that you can do quick sketches and, you know, think of the big picture. I see that you really love to draw dragons. That's really awesome. And uh, I would say that my suggestion for you would be, uh, it's just a suggestion, like, but I think it would be interesting if you could also add other types of creatures besides dragons. Maybe you can make a, uh, I know that the theme that you like is dragons, but maybe you can try to mix a, a dragon with a, a lion or a wolf, you know, and uh, try to come up with different concepts. I think that would be very nice. And also uh, something very important to consider is, I noticed that, uh, like if you squint your eyes, you're going to notice that there are some colors here in the background that they're catching. Like you, you're, I'm paying attention way too much to the green of the background rather than the dragons here. And also the blue of the water is like really saturated. So you always have to think of what is your focal point, you know? So what I would do is lo I will lower a little bit of the opacity of the background because you, you know, by doing that, you're immediately going to pay more attention to the moment that is happening here between the dragons. You know, you already have some elements here that help to reinforce the viewer's eyes to look towards them, like the clouds over here. That's really good. And uh, I think the only element missing, like I said, is the color saturation. And, uh, and if you do that, I think it's going to make that artwork pop a bit more. And the same thing goes for the other ones. I think that just try to tone down just a little bit the saturation and the contrast. You don't have to add the same value for every single, uh, uh, what do you call those? Like those balloons. Uh, just try to make sure that you add the brightest spots close to where the main focus is going to be. But again, like really great work. I like, uh, I really love these dragons. They look really good. That's really nice. And I will, like I said, I would love to see different styles of dragons. Like, you know, kind of like going to, into this direction. This is beautiful. This is really beautiful. 
you know, maybe like a tiger looking dragon, uh, you know, or maybe other mythical creatures like a griffin or something, different species. So the clients can see that you can draw all sorts of, you know, creatures and things like that. And, uh, and yeah, that's it for the feedbacks. Now, I'm gonna go over. If anybody's got any questions, you can throw them in the chat. Um, oh, we'll okay. Go over them. Uh, you can continue on, Esther. I would just uh, oh. kind of feed in some some uh, questions if anybody's got any. Okay. All right. So for today's uh, webinar, I'm going to be doing a uh, this painting already got the rough painting done. I'm going to explain to you a little bit of the thought process that I usually put when before I start doing my work. So for this one, uh, I first started with a sketch of a wolf. And I started to add some different elements to it. Like I wanted to make the fur look a little bit as if it has this feeling of smoke fire thing. And right after I got the design ready, I started working with the colors. And what I usually like to do is I grab a bunch of reference of uh, white wolves because this is what I'm going to paint. It's gonna be a white wolf with like crazy uh, fur uh, flow. So now, this is one of them, and also I looked at several videos of uh, white wolves just to see how the color and the values they behave, you know, they they play in the environment, like how the color changes, you know, composition, things like that. And that was really helpful. So always make sure that you have a lot of reference, uh, you know, surround yourself with references, have them right next to you, because that's going to really help you uh, during the painting process. And right after I gathered the references, I did like a really quick sketch using colors and also thinking of the values to bring this all together. So let me just put it big in here. So like this is like really rough. It's just for me to get a feeling of where I want to go. It doesn't have all the details that I want yet. It's just so I have uh, somewhere to start. So once I get the rough, uh, the rough done, I go ahead and I do the cleanup. You know, I did a few things, I fixed a few, a few things uh, and also the flow of the fur because I wasn't sure what flow I was gonna use. And uh, in the cleanup, I decided to go for something more like this. One second. Um, and so I started already, uh, I added a bit of the, some of the elements just to get started. And let me just go back here to the, to the rough, just to show you how important it is that your picture is easy to read uh, with values, because if you get this reading, at first, with the values, then you're good to go to move on with the colors. Hey, Esther, can I ask you a question? Oh, yeah, sure. All right. Um, so we have a, um, a quick one. Um, someone, uh, can you go over how to add the posterized layer? Oh, of course. And, and then also, um, Cherry asks, Regarding the wolf, I see for the face, you have the muscle shape sketched out as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think would be the most prominent parts that can be applied to animals such as wolves and dogs? Mm, what, what, does she mean? what do you mean by like prominent parts? Like, like uh, the muscles the... around the brow, etc. Oh, okay. Th th that really is going to change for, from drawing to drawing because uh, it depends on what you want to enhance because there, for example, there's going to be some muscle groups that they're not going, you're not going to really want to highlight them. But at the same time, you want to keep it as simple as possible and try to make sure that you use the right lines to 
you know, in other words, like whatever brings more volume and form into the animal, then, you know, then you should, then you should put it. If you feel like it's missing a little bit of the shape of the animal, you know, go ahead, edit, or if you think it's too much, then remove it. Uh, and for this one, I added a little bit of some of uh, the guidelines just so I keep track of the planes of the face. And so I know like which side the face is uh, facing, so I know the, where to put the shadows and the light. So I keep that in the cleanup sketch. And as I start the painting, uh, as I, sorry, as I progress in the painting process, I just go ahead and remove little by little of those details. And I just leave just a little bit of the line work depending on how much is needed in there. And also, uh, uh, so is that is that clear for you? Yeah, it's clear to me. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, what was the other question? The uh, can you right. add a layer to check the posterize? Can you go through that process real quick? Uh, of course. Can you guys see the the settings here on the right of my screen? Sure can. OK. So here's what I like to do. I create a folder. And inside this folder, I put one blank layer. I pick the 100% black color. You throw it over there with a bucket. Then you go over to color. You change this layer mode to color. So you're going to have a more accurate representation of what your colors look like if, they're, if you're using values. And then you go over here to this icon. And then you're going to find here posterize. And I usually I keep it over the the dark layer. And here's what I like how I like to work with it. So I usually go for like so the levels are going to represent uh you know how many how many uh how can you say levels of black and white you're going to have so you're going to have two values here and then three, four, and so on and on. I try to go between two and six, uh, but I usually like to start with three. So during the block out stage, it's good for you to have, uh, to try to progress uh, the your value range as you go. So let's say if you moved on into your painting, try to raise it to four and try to see if you're, values are as simple as possible you know they're you know all the shapes they are easy to read and yeah it's a, it's a great way you know for you to study and keep track of uh, the composition of your painting all right so and again this is what i mostly do for my, you know most of my paintings uh the this quick sketch right here, I usually go ahead and I paint from really far away. I avoid zooming in because my goal is to try to see how everything's going to work together. So I'm really messy. I just go ahead and, uh, and I make sure that the brush is, is big enough. And I just try to get the, the feeling first. And once I see something that I like, I go ahead and start the cleanup as soon as possible. Um, so first, what I want to work on is going to be the rim light that you see in the back. I'm going to, I'll just color it because uh, all the colors that I want, they're already there. So, and I like to use this brush here. I lower the opacity of the line work so it doesn't uh, because sometimes it, it bothers me to see the the silhouette of the drawing overall. So and I really like this brush because it, it gives like a really nice texture. And what I'm doing here, I'm starting with, uh, remember, you have to slide through the color wheel. I'm starting from, in, you know, right around here. And the brightest color of the rim light is going to go all the way here.
Oh, and uh, for everybody watching, what uh, plugin do you use for your color wheel? Oh, I use colors. I think it's really, I mean, uh, to me, I think it's really helpful. It helps me to figure it out uh, a bit more of like how I can use the color scheme, like, you know, come up with different color schemes and things like that. I'm not sure how much it costs uh, right now. I think it was around $14, but I think it's totally worth it. I like to have the navigator here. So I, because I, I don't know if it makes sense, but to me, I like to have a second screen, like, you know, showing, uh, the, the, you know, the, the painting. So it's kind of like having a different perspective of, of how things are looking. Especially because if you spend long periods of time, look at the computer screen, your eyes are going to start to get a little bit, you're going to start to get a little bit tired of looking at it. So it kind of gives you a rest in a way and uh, it keeps you on track of what it needs to be done in the painting. And once I add this, and you're going to notice that I jump from a topic from to uh, area to area, like uh, when I'm doing the painting. So I do the background a little bit, and then I jump to do the the fur of the wolf, and that really helps me to uh, take a break from one part of the painting and moving to another one. Because, like I said, when you're you know, painting for way too long, you tend to stop seeing things uh, that need to be, you know, fixed. So it's important for you to keep that in mind. Try to keep your brush strokes like really big for now. Do you typically have uh, like your go-to brushes or do you change them like per project? Yeah, I definitely change them per pro project. Uh, it, it, for example, it depends on what the client wants. So uh, yeah, it really depends on what they want, like what type of style they want to use. Uh, and the same thing goes for my personal project. Sometimes I, I want to experiment with different types of brushes. Sometimes I, I'll be using like the same group, group of uh, brushes, but I try to diversify as much as I can. Now I start to work like, you know, thinking of layers, not just the, like, you know, layers from Photoshop, but, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, layer of, of, you know, valleys and paintings. So make sure that you keep them uh, very organized. For example, I have these uh, color and value located in here. So I want to make sure that both of them are in the right place, you know, avoid trying to uh, 
how can I say, but like make sure that every single shape, like even from the from the light is like well defined. Like for example, right here, I'm defining the shape of the eyebrows. Got a quick question. Ebony asks, uh, do you like to start a new layer for every color or section? Uh, it really depends. If I'm really not sure of uh, how something is gonna, uh, you know, if I want to experiment something, in the painting process, then I'll go ahead and create a different layer. And, and uh, if it works, I just go ahead and merge everything. Or sometimes I wait a little bit, like it really depends of uh, what I'm trying to achieve with it. But I usually recommend to, you know, first start uh, separating the layers, not for every single thing. But you know, but some of the elements, like you know, the light, you know, from the shadow, and then the, from the different other groups of shadow and light, it keeps it, uh, things a little bit more organized. Not only in the layout here, but also in your work. I love to flip the canvas. It just helps to. Sometimes I, I have a hard time like painting one direction, so you just change it. Uh, it makes your process way easier. And always squint your eyes because you you're trying to look for the for the main idea of the painting, so you don't get distracted with little details. Is there a shortcut key to flip the canvas? Yes, uh, you can set that up on your Photoshop. Uh, I just I forgot where exactly is, but I set, set up mine to, for, to be Command H. Oh, uh, someone's asking what brush this is. Did you make this one or is this? Um... Oh, this one I got from uh, 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 somebody else, but I also modify it uh, a little bit to something that I can use, for example, when I paint fur.
Uh, really one like question it. about uh, your techniques. Uh, in uh, your past drawing, the fox one and the um, lion uh, rosy one, uh, did you use uh, these techniques or uh, grayscales? Oh, I use the, the, the same techniques. I, I, I think I use a different type of brush, but uh, the process that I explained to you, like in terms of, you know, starting with uh, doing research with the references and then all over to painting the, the rough sketch, like that, that, that was the same process. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh, no problem. I always make sure like I try to paint uh, the strokes uh, on the same direction that the fur is going, just to keep it a bit more natural. Sometimes I won't do it, it really depends on the situation, but for this one, I go in the direction of the flow of the fur. Got a question from Sarah Krebs. Uh, I'm a game art student for concept art and illustration. I need to apply for jobs soon. Do you have any tips on how to really let your portfolio shine? Like how much variation should there be? And what is generally good to have? So one of the things that I highly recommend, like uh, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna try to tell you about how uh, was my ex personal experience? And I think one of the things that uh, studios like to see is that you're constantly updating uh, your work. Make sure that you show them that you're constantly growing, you're constantly you know, studying all the time uh, because it's gonna come to a point that, you know, for example, I had people from like, you know, studios like I'd say Disney and they're following me for like, years you know even when i you know I, I was still in college and i felt that my work was still not there but there's something about it that they liked it and after six years they decided to uh reach out to me to you know for me to get to work for them so that's one thing and also make sure that uh you try to have like uh one focus, you know, if you're gonna do concept art or illustration or character design, and make sure that your portfolio shows it. You know, let's say like if you're specialized in character design, then make sure you have character design. Then you know, but if you have a lot of let's say buildings and like car designs, then, then you know that, and then you know the clients they're going to reach out to you based on what is showing your portfolio. So you need you need to make sure that there is that clarity that you know it, that whatever you specialize on is showing in your work and also uh uh that's optional you don't have to do it but i think social media in my experience played a a, a huge role in terms of getting uh contacts from different types of studios so i think that uh like you know it doesn't have to be uh, just art stage. You can have Instagram, Tumblr, Facebook groups because some of these clients they're they're in these uh, types of you know social media. So you, like like I said, like you never know where where you go, like you know where work is gonna come from. And most of my clients, you know, from this big studios, they they were all on Instagram, and that's how I got to. Uh, get to work pretty much i hope i hope this uh this was helpful if you if you need uh if you have other questions just let me know about this subject and one thing that i've always said for like i do environment art and one thing i've always told students is like if you're working on your portfolio and you don't want to be the tree guy don't <laughs> put a bunch of trees in your portfolio Yes, exactly. If you show that you can do it really well and trees and rocks and stuff like that, you're going to be that guy. So make sure you put in there what you want to do. 
Yeah, true. Yeah, just like Spicer said, you know, if you don't like to draw trees, but you have trees in your portfolio, then you know, uh, you mostly get contact by for, for clients. We, you know, they're going to ask you to do trees and uh, pretty much. Uh, Sarah also asks, what do you think is generally easy, easier to get into for the start, concept art or illustration? My heart is more into illustration, but all my teachers tell me I should do concept art. Uh, I would say that, well, to be, let me just think. I think that the areas that have more competition, they're going to, to be the hardest to get, like, Character design is definitely one of them, and you know, character modeling. Uh, those are the things that I would hear when I was in, in still in school. They would tell us like, you know, it's gonna be way more competitive if you're going for character uh, designers. So just be aware of that, and uh, and and that was the, the path that I took. Uh, but you know, it takes a lot of training and uh, patience, you know, because once you get out of college, it's not going to be like you're not going to get the work right away. You got it you have to build towards that goal, you know, like make sure that you always uh, update your stuff, you know, show the clients that you're always growing and eventually you're going to start to get a lot of work. I doubt that, that's how it was for me. As soon as I graduated, uh, there wasn't that much going on, you know, so I spent a lot of time sharing my stuff online. And little by little, uh, it came to a point that I don't have to reach out to clients to get work. Like they always reach out to me. You know, uh, there's going to be uh, a few seasons where you're not going to see a lot of people contacting you, but that's completely normal. You know, but th there's going to be the high season where you see like, like all of your clients contacting you all at, at once. So then, you know, like, again, that, that takes time. You need to have patience, you know, uh, and like, always keep growing, you know, like always keep studying. Tanya Stein asks, uh, in traditional art, uh, there are exercises you can do to improve your technique, like drawing a hand a hundred times. Do you know of anything like this you can do to improve our digital art? Yes, like uh, I wouldn't recommend you to sit down like in one day and do like eight hours a day of studies, like because like that was a mistake that I actually did. Uh, because I, I learned that I wasn't being really efficient, you know. So you gotta make sure that you're always very efficient when you're doing your studies. Like if you're going, to, like I would recommend maybe sitting like uh, two to four hours a day, maybe just one hour, and pick a topic, and you know. For example, like for example, for one week you're just gonna draw gonna draw hands, right? So make sure that you take one hour of your day, you're just going to focus on hands, and in one week, trust me, you you're going to have uh, a lot of progress. But you always gotta make sure that you're efficient, that you're not just copying from what you're seeing. You know, you have to make sure that you're actually, uh, you know, paying attention to what you're studying. Sometimes you, we get caught uh, caught up on. Uh, like the little details and uh, and we end up not like, you know, uh, learning that much.
going to go back to the background and I'm going to add a little bit more of that ring light. Yes, this is one of those uh, things when, when we were talking about separating your layers and keeping them separated. You'd probably want your background you know, separated most of the time and like your oh, room yeah. light. Yes, you want to make sure that it's separated unless you're very confident in, in what you're doing. Because I, I see that there are some artists that they can actually draw with everything merged, you know, but you know, that's their, their way of, you know, that's their workflow. But I, and if you're getting, if you still find it difficult to work with shading and lighting, then I highly recommend you to like keep them separated and work uh, step by step. Like think of like, you know, all the uh, elements from the shadow family, you know, and also the elements from the, from the light family. Carla Bari asked, do you have any, any advice on how to get started working in concept art? Uh, so for, for you, uh, I would say, I'm just think here. Try to like, try to grow as much as, like, you know, as much as you can, like learning from other artists and also, like, you know, if you get the opportunity to work for a client, make sure that you also learn from that experience, you know, you know, the tips that the art director gives you, they're going to be very important. Uh, and I think that, like I said, like learning from other artists, like uh, try to study from different artists, like every once in a while, let's say every week, you pick one of your favorites and try to understand uh, their workflow, you know, because I think that, like, you know, it, I think it doesn't matter what uh, top, like, what type of job uh, you want to, you want to pick, like, I think what it really matters is that you're always growing, you know, you always have to keep on growing, you know, especially in art, you always have to make sure that you're studying because uh, once you stop studying, then you know you're not going to have that growth anymore, and uh, you know your work is going to stop looking as interesting as you know as it could potentially be. So always make sure, like you know, study like always, even if you feel like you're already rich, like the. The max, like always study. I see a lot of uh, artists from the industry that they are still studying, you know. Uh, personally, I would say like one thing that make sure that if you go into concept or illustration that you love it. Because if, oh, yeah. if you hate your job, then you're you're gonna you're not gonna have a great you know not a great time doing it so make yeah. sure that you love whatever you pick um so if you love doing illustration then go for it like don't don't just choose concept just because it's there um if you don't enjoy doing it yeah no that's that's totally right like if you if you don't like it you're not gonna see that growth because what makes us good at it is like, you know, it, because artists, I think they, they have to be just like scientists. That's what someone told me once. You always have to be curious about experimenting. And if you are going to do that, you need to be interested into the topic that you're actually working on, you know.
Uh, Cherry asks if uh, you have a schedule you follow on a daily basis for your work. Like what times does your morning usually start sitting down and working if you take any breaks? So I try to be as flexible as possible because uh, you know, I'm a freelancer. So sometimes I'm going to have more clients than the usual. Uh, some months I'm going to have less. So uh, whenever I see that uh, I don't have many clients like in a certain month, then I spend most of my mornings doing studies and focusing more on sharing on my social media. And when I see myself having, you know, a, like a lot of clients all at once, then I make sure that I spend less time studying, you know, like, let's say I usually study like, you know, I do four hours of like personal work. And if I have a lot of clients, I just do like one hour a day, just so I keep track of the work and I don't have to, uh, so I don't procrastinate on it that much. It's good to like, you know, take a break from the client work and go a bit back onto the personal. That's actually very important for you to have that balance. And I always make sure, you know, I try to wake up as early as I can. And if there, like, you know, there's gonna be days that I, I you know, maybe, I don't know, something happened, I had to stay up late and I couldn't uh, wake up early, then I try to make up the time uh, on the next day. Uh, you have the ultimate question. What artists have inspired you? Wow, I have a, <laughs> I have a ton of art. You mean that inspired me, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I would, I'm going to name the, some of my like real like favorites. The first one I would say Aaron Blaze. You know, I think I've mentioned that tons of times on my social media. Uh, he's definitely one of my favorites. Then there is uh, Loish, uh, Lover Work, uh, Glenn Keane, uh, Claire Wendling, uh, Tara Witchlatch. Uh, let me see. There is Vixie. Uh, her profile on her Facebook, on her Instagram, I think it's Vixie Art, something like that. I, I, I pretty much started, when I first uh, created my Instagram, she was one of the first artists that I started following. Um, there's also Tumbarella. She's also one of the biggest influences. And I would say that these are my main ones. I know there is more, but those are the ones that I usually am checking out their stuff more often. Uh, Tejas uh, asks, what are the other branches you could go into, for example, concept art, illustration, or what other uh, types of fields are there that you can name mm. off? Mm, wait, could you repeat that question again? I don't understand. Uh, like what, uh, what other fields in 2D art um, are there, like concept art, illustration? <laughs> you got environment illustration there's 
yeah, um, so you can do 2D animation as well. There is a graphic design. Um, I mean, you can you even want, break it down like character yeah, modeling. Yeah, that too. You, you can also well, like architecture as well. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. You got sketch artists. Yeah, that too. Tessa asks, um, what kind of art education did you receive or are you self-taught? Uh, so I graduated from Fuka University and I first, I was going to go for character modeling, but I, I, but at the same time, I always had this passion for uh, character uh, design, you know, like doing sketches uh, 2D and illustration. And uh, as soon as I graduated, I just literally kind of uh, shifted to, to go to more of this 2D uh, industry. Um, and, uh, and there are some things that I had to learn on my own, like some things that they were not taught during a uh, school time I, because I learned a bit more of the 3D side. So I took uh, a few online classes, including the ones from School Lism and uh, CGM, CGMA. And also I had, uh, I learned with uh, mentors, because uh, there's, there's always something new to learn, like, I think it was a, a great experience to have, you know, learn a bit in, in the university and then learning from uh, online courses. Sorry if I don't say, uh, if I don't uh, talk much at this at this point, uh, sometimes I just get like really focused. Uh, but if you guys have any questions, just uh, let me know anything that you would like to know about the painting process, my painting process, and things like that. Uh, Maria asks, how many hours max can you paint before you burn out? <laughs> well, it really depends because I, so here's the thing. I'm that type of person that I love to paint. So sometimes I'm just going to spend a lot of time in one painting just because I love the, you know, to do this. You know, sometimes I'm going to go really slow because it's, to me, it's kind of relaxing, you know. But of course, there's some, you know, there's some deadlines that I have to keep in my, you know, schedule. So I try to go for it can go between two hours to ten hours, depending on the type of illustration that I do. For example, if I'm taking way too long in terms of trying to figure it out, the composition, I'm looking for references, then that could take like, how can I say, more than 10 hours, I would say. Like, I would take a few days, you know, doing research. That's what I did for the lion and the rose. Uh, I didn't, uh, you know, I did the, the rough painting first. You know, I just tried to, like, I tried to be as abstract as possible. Like, you know, I was trying to, get to understand what I actually wanted, you know, to, to accomplish with that painting. 
And after I got the idea, uh, I was still a little bit stuck. So I decided to take some time off and I started to look for references, like, you know, from other artists, start to look for concepts that were done uh, similar to what I've done it. And uh, I think I spent like a week or two just taking a break and then going back and forward until once I finally uh, saw that, oh, okay, this is the concept that I want to go for, then I, I just sat down and I painted that for, I would say it took me eight hours in total, like between six to eight hours to finish the, the cleanup of that painting. Got a question. What type of work do wildlife artists do? What do they focus on mainly? What type of projects do they do? Not sure what that means, but maybe you do. Uh, wildlife artist? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what do you mean. Uh, what do you mean by that? I mean, the only thing that comes to my mind when when I hear a uh, wildlife artist, like, uh, you know, those those uh, science books that you see the illustrations of like dinosaurs and prehistoric uh, animals. Uh, like I, I've, I've, I've known some artists that do that type of work. Uh, that was initially one of the things that I wanted to do. Like draw for like National Geographic, something like that. Does that answer your question, Tejas? Sharice is asking, do you ever feel rushed and start painting quickly? Some I've been struggling with and it causes issues in the final work, but I'm not sure how to tell myself to slow down once I'm focused in a focused mode. Any tips? Oh, I think that, 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 that's going to come uh, with time because it's going to take a lot of practice in order for you to, you know, be patient, have enough patience in order to, you know, paint things because uh, things take time. You know, I, I would. I would highly recommend it to not, don't rush the process, you know, don't get caught up with like, you know, you see it, like there's a lot of artists on Instagram that they are really fast at painting things like every day they're sharing something, you know, but don't be afraid of taking your time because uh, that, that's something that, that's a lesson that I learned after I took a mentorship over, I think two years ago, my teacher was telling me to go slow because you, you have the thing, but because you're rushing the process, uh, you're not getting to your full potential. And as soon as I heard that, my, when I spent way more time on my paintings, I realized that the quality went up like a thousand times more. So always take your time. Don't worry about how long that person is taking or not. It's all about your process, you know? But at the same time, you have to consider this. If you're doing a work for a client, then yeah, you have to keep up with the with the schedule, you know, that you you know, you have to keep up with, you know, when you guys determine to, you know, get get it all done. Because you don't want to deliver anything late or something like that. So make sure that you have uh, how can you say the your painting process for clients is, uh, you know, it's different from your personal project because for clients, you want to have a, a style that is quicker for you to execute the, the art pieces. You, you know, you, for example, when I told you like that, sometimes I like to meditate and just paint really slow, uh, that type of painting, I, I don't do it with my clients because, you know, there is a time that I have to deliver things, but I do that mostly for personal projects.
Uh, Cherry had a question uh, with painting the wolf. What makes you choose lighter color that is in a bluish tone when you're painting the rest of the shadows in more of a brownish orange tone? Oh, it's because, uh, so remember I mentioned that I did several studies of what the fur, the white fur looks like, you know, in this type of composition, like the rim light. I wanted the composition to have a rim light and focus on painting the shadow side, you know, of the wolf. So here's what happened. So we can, we can clearly see that the wolf is outside, right? So the light, it's coming from just one second. Let me. Okay, so the light is coming behind the wolf in this direction right here. And uh, this is going to be your light. And you're going to notice that there is some bluish color over here. And that's going to be the the light coming from the sky, like the natural color from the environment. That's why you're going to have this bluish, uh, greenish colors. And you're going, you're going to start to notice that down below it starts to get warmer. It's because when light bounces in the surface, you know, on the ground, it, it, that's what it does. The light falls into the ground, and it spreads. And, all every direction, but once it hits the ground, it starts to lose its uh, its intensity. So it's gonna hit the wolf, and then it's gonna hit another. Let's say I don't know the tree, and then it's gonna bounce back in the wolf, and it's gonna come back even weaker. And remember, the bounce light is going to be in the shadow family. In other words, uh, and the same thing goes for the light that is coming from the sky. Yeah. Uh, so in other words, you don't want you you gotta make sure that the values uh, in the shadow are not as bright as the ones that are showing the light. Otherwise, you're going to lose that, uh, the contrast in your painting. So always keep track of that, uh, of your values, you know, and make sure that they are all in place. So if you want, uh, but, but again, you have to remind yourself that this is uh, in order for you to learn. Uh, you can try to color pick just so you can understand what is going on on the scene, but I don't recommend you color painting just to get the painting done. You know, make sure that you do it and try to check and understand like, uh, why uh, that color is there and, you know, what makes it, you know, why that those color groups make the, the composition look good, you know. Here's a good one. Uh, Sarah asks, what do you do against art block when you have a client waiting? Do you force yourself to work or do you wait it out? Uh, it really depends. Like uh, if I, if there's a deadline, um, then I'll, I'll do the work no matter what. Even for personal work, I try to not let the art block control me because, you know, if I, if I let anxiety take over, then I, I think I wouldn't even draw at all. So I always try to, you know, overcome your fears. Uh, make sure that you don't let all of these things influence you when it comes to like, you know, if, if you feel like too nervous to put something on paper, just go and do it. Like, trust me, if you spend at least like five minutes starting something out, you know, like spend at least like 15 minutes, you will eventually get the feeling of the painting and you're going to stop to feel nervous and if you turn that into a habit you will eventually do that in a skip of you know 
you know, in a heartbeat, you're not going to think twice if you're nervous or not, you're just going to do it because you have to get things done. You see what I mean? Tonya asks, how do you pick your color palette? I'm having trouble in that aspect. So uh, the, uh, what I recommend you doing is like do a lot of studies because you have to understand the concept of color. You know, you have to understand like why is it there, you know, understand what, you know, the, the, the rules of shading and lighting. I, uh, that's what I recommend to you, you know, because it's going to come to a point that that's going to be become like very natural to you. You know, you're not you're not going to even think twice before you pick your color palette, you know. Right, here's one ultimate question that I think everyone has heard so many times. I'm a senior in high school trying to figure out which way I should go. Do you recommend going to college to study in art? I've heard some stories of how it's not worth it and it's better to teach yourself. Uh, I would definitely, like I wouldn't go down that road of like just uh, teaching yourself. I think it's important that you get some advice from people from the industry, you know, because there's a, like there's a lot of things that they know that you that they only share in the studio and you might never know if you never actually interacted with them so uh, like you know if you let's say but at the same time like if you feel like going to the university is too expensive for you then you know uh, one option that you have is like you know study by yourself but always make sure that you're always doing research you know go to art events and ask people for advice, you know, go to social media and ask them for critiques and, but also make sure uh, you know where your critique is coming from because you don't wanna have someone, uh, you know, criticizing, giving you like a bad critique and not giving you credit for something that you spent hours working on, you see? And also there's the option of like, uh, you know, online courses and things like that. Like, that, that's what I would recommend if, you cannot afford to go to university. But if you do, I think uh, it's, a, it's a really good option, you know. You get to share with a lot of artists and uh, learn from them. Yeah, I would say if you, if you want to, if you go to a university or a private um, college, like the Art Institute or anything, know what you're getting yourself into you're going to come out with uh, quite a lot of debt unless you can work your way through school, which most people uh, don't do that. Um, yeah. But it is very expensive uh, to go to private institutes uh, for school. I would suggest if you do go to school, go to like Noman. Um, uh, that and, one was really good. Yeah, they they have a very high success rate of getting people jobs in the industry. Um, and that's one thing you should ask if you go interview at a school is find out what their job placement is in the industry. And don't just ask them what their job placement is because a lot of them will lie about it and they'll tell you that they have like 80% job placement. And that's not exactly accurate because they can say if you got a job uh, like working at Walmart, you got a job. So that counts towards their job placement. So be very careful when you uh, go and talk to schools. But I definitely recommend uh, personally to do mentorships online um, and work your way through it because there's plenty of really, really talented artists that you can do mentorships with. Um, and tons of uh, information online. Yeah, definitely. I think mentorships are really great. I took one like two years ago and uh, it really helped me to figure it out uh, a more uh, efficient way to grow as an artist. And that was definitely worth it. Because from there, you, you just start growing on your own, you know.
And speaking of uh, mentorships, um, Esther, I believe uh, you might have your own mentorship. Oh, yes. I'm giving, uh, so I have a mentorship with XMD Academy and uh, the main topic that I teach in there is animal anatomy. And I try to teach my students on how they can grow uh, in a more efficient way so they don't have to be, uh, how can I say, because that was the main complaint that I noticed from young artists. They would tell me like, what is the most efficient way for me to study? Because I, I feel like that I'm stuck and I don't know what to do. And uh, that's the solution that I bring for my students, for them to understand, you know, a bit of uh, how the industry works. You know, if you, especially if you're going to be a character artist or illustrator, I think that, you know, for, uh, for someone who is getting just getting started, it's uh, I think it's it's totally worth it. And from there, you're just gonna learn to you're gonna know how to study. And that that was that was a, and that's a method that has been working for me because uh, sometimes I spend uh, after learning from instructor, I spend a, uh, a few times like studying on my own, and I started to notice that growth, and I. And my goal is to pass on to my students everything that I've learned so they can uh, can easily like you know find ways to improve their art. Yeah, and Esther's mentorship is one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you will get uh, an hour a week uh, with Esther to um, ask uh, any questions you want, uh, any of the course uh, material. You get all of it immediately when you register. Um, and then yeah, each of your one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions are more of uh, just further learning. Cherry's got a question. Which uh, technique aspect of drawing do you find the most challenging? Uh, which part of learning to draw was hardest to overcome? Oh, God, I think gesture drawing to me was the most difficult because that was something that I wasn't practicing enough. You know, uh, I only got to study gesture drawing when I got to in, in a university, and, you know, and, and it was. I, even after I graduated, when I felt that I, I didn't spend enough time on it, and once I asked this teacher how it was looking, because I wanted to apply for jobs at Disney, and he said that my finished work looked, uh, you know, he he was a big fan of my work, like the finished version. But when he looked at my gesture drawings, he was like, "I cannot send you a letter of recommendation anymore because this it has to you you need to get better at it." So. I literally, I like, that didn't really, that didn't hurt me, you know, because I, I knew that that was something that I needed to get better at. So what I did was I, I went straight home and like from then on, I just started to practice a lot, a lot of gesture drawings. And they're not like, not only to get jobs, but also that really helped me to uh, sketch things like 10 times faster, you know, to get the idea of the painting on the canvas, you know, faster, because I was like really slow and and uh, that wasn't really helping me at all. So if you feel like you're having difficulties in the subject, you know, just go ahead and you know, sit down and try to focus on that as much as you can because, uh, but of course, like I said, you have to be uh, efficient because eventually you're going to see a lot of improvement and uh, that's totally worth it.
and after I spent a, a while in the painting, I just start to merge everything because keeping them all separately sometimes it bothers me. Uh, but that's uh, because I, after a while, I just feel like I'm confident enough to just move on and, and start adding the start moving faster with it. We got some questions rolling in. Uh, what canvas size do you usually use? Uh, let me see if I can put it in here. So this is the canvas size that I usually go for. Is there anything that made you choose that specifically? Uh, just that I feel like this is the, the quality is just enough, you know, if I'm going to share that online. Uh, but if I'm going to make a print, uh, I usually, and, you know, I put the resolution for uh, 300 and just increase the pixels just a little bit more. Um, and yeah, like there is, uh, just make sure that, I think the minimum if you're going to share that online is, it has to be like around 75 uh, for the resolution, just so the pixels are good enough. Uh, Amanda's asking what kind of uh, device are you using? What kind of tablet? I'm using the XP Pen. Uh, let me see. Uh, it's this one right here. I just forgot the, uh, the the name of this one, but it's the, the okay. small version. X, okay, XP Pen right here. <clears throat> it's a nice uh, cheap ver or cheaper. Uh, uh huh cost than the Wacom if you can't afford a Wacom. Yeah, I think XPP has a really great quality, you know, I think it can, I, I totally recommend it. Yeah, I, I like the the feel of the screen. It's yeah, kind of like a paper quality to it. Yeah, me too. I think that uh, the screen quality is just great. It is bright enough. Also, as you can see here, I have like the rough sketches on just so I keep track of like uh, things like the the anatomy and to see what's going on here underneath the, the fur because sometimes I just lose track of it and I have to take a look at what I did in order to continue. Ebony's asking uh, the little uh, image in the corner of your canvas. Is that your reference image? Uh, you mean this one? I think she's talking about like, the littler. Yeah, that one. Oh, OK, yes, that's the reference I'm using. I did the quicker version, uh, the rough version of the painting first, just so I could get the feeling of what I wanted. Like, it's really rough, and then once uh, I got the feeling of the final, you know, what I wanted for the final version, I just jumped into the, to the, to do the cleanup.
And so Esther, what is your favorite animal? Wow, I, well, I think it's obvious I, I really like big cats, but out of all the big cats that exist, I think, uh, I mean, between lions and tigers, they're definitely my favorites. They just look like so majestic. Something to pay attention to is when you're adding, working on the shadows, uh, always work on the, you know, on that bounce light. Remember the light is gonna hit the floor and then hit the, like, you know, into bounce back into different directions. And that is going to, that's what is gonna, going to bring light to, to your painting. Sometimes I go back and I'll look at the, the references I have so I can keep track of the of the colors. Just in here. Yeah, Esther, um, I'm not sure, did you answer uh, if there's a skill level required for the mentorship? Uh, so the mentorship is, is mostly focused for beginners, people who, like if you think that you're struggling with anatomy, 
let's say understanding like the perspective how to draw these animals from imaginations maybe struggling with uh, looking for your style then that course is definitely for you and also if you're looking for you know like for ways to if you feel like you're the study methods are not being very efficient then you know my courses will definitely teach you how to you know study for life you know so and also in a more efficient way I think Ebony was gone for this. Uh, just shout out again for anybody that uh, may have just shown up, but uh, who would you say your biggest influences are? Oh, okay. So my biggest influences are, um, one of them, I think is, is my favorite, it's Aaron Blaze. He's definitely, he's, he definitely influenced me. Uh, who else did I mention? There's Loish, uh, Glenn Keen, uh, Claire Wendling, Tara Witchlatch, uh, Tumbarella, Dixie. Oh, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, I think that those are the main ones. So Maria is asking, did you ever have um, a big burnout? How did you overcome it? Uh, what, what, sorry, but what, what does burnout mean again? Uh, it's like when you're working too much and you just don't want to draw at all. You want to quit. Yeah, you want to yeah. quit. Oh my God. Yes, I did. Like, because here's the thing. I, I think my strength is also like one of my weaknesses because I love to draw in uh Sometimes when I'm really way too hooked up into what I'm doing, like doesn't matter if it's personal project or a client's project, like it's hard for me to stop. So uh, that was one time that I just, I, I overworked like for a long period of time, you know, and that was just not, that wasn't good for me. So I think I took like uh, two months without looking at my computer screen for quite, a good amount of time and and I and eventually I started to learn like to control myself just a bit more so I don't you know like you know it's something that I really love it but at the same time like I have to tone it down a little bit from time to time yeah I know I've had burnout many times and anybody that has been in the industry for a while has gone through 
many yeah. episodes of burnout and you just uh you kind of find your own way of working through it i think it it kind of depends on the person themselves like i personally i'll just unplug for a day or two and you know just like go on a hike or do something outside just uh relax yeah. um because i know i probably work way too much that i have you know like full-time job plus xmd on the side so um but yeah I, i've definitely been through it several times i think anyone you just find your own way of working through it yeah you have to find that uh that balance otherwise uh, it's not it's not healthy at all to be like on the computer for like long hours you, you gotta rest because sometimes when you're not rested uh most of the time the quality of your work can drop for that i've never experienced burnout what ever that's because you're like <laughs> you're like I always god <laughs> I keep working oh, yeah. and I never stop. <laughs> oh my god, that's like god level. And I think I don't know. When I was younger, I was able to be on the computer for longer periods of time. But as I got older, it's just it's just way harder. Yeah, how many breaks do you take like every hour just a couple times a day because i've had an issue where i sometimes work 16 hours straight without standing up once oh my god i try to take a break like every one hour like uh i would see maybe every two to three hours sometimes it's less it depends on uh how much time i you know because sometimes like there are some things that it, it, it's they take me way too long to figure it out so i take a break and then i come back uh see what's uh to see if i can really see what else i need to change it if not and i just stop for the day and then i i continue in the next day yeah i would say if you want a good gauge of like how often you should take a break get a dog <laughs> Because a dog will make you take a break. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. I started to take more breaks ever since we adopted uh, mm -hmm. Cookie. She's our dog. And uh, she she has she's a mix of like super energetic, but she can also be very lazy, just sleep for long, period, long periods of time. But <laughs> I, try you know, to I always got to get up and take mine out or, you know, like they come in wanting food. I mean, Oh, yeah. Food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get a German Shepherd, and every hour on the hour, you will be going outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. much. <laughs> I got three dogs. So, uh, yeah, I feel it. So Esther, um, what moment of truth here, what a kind of, uh, would you like to give these fine folks that, uh, have stuck with us through this entire thing and we're not even done yet. Uh -huh. Would you like to give them, uh, a coupon for joining your course? Yeah, of course. How much would you like to give them? I will leave it up to you. Wow. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, God. I, I'm not sure. Uh, Just 2%. Just 2%. Just 2%. <laughs> I, come on. You can at least go three. <laughs> I think. No pressure. I give it, okay. Uh, <laughs> I could give like a 20% off. Okay, 30. 20. I need. You want to go 30? 
Let's go thirty then. All right. All right. Yeah. So, all you awesome people that want thirty percent off of this course, especially if you couldn't afford it before, and this also works on the monthly. So thirty percent off uh, for three months, definitely affordable now, and it will also work on the on demand. So that would give you about a hundred bucks off of the on demand. Let's yes. see. So let's see mentorship. What does that give you? Um, I give you two hundred and forty bucks off of the mentorship. Awesome. It's almost a hundred bucks per month. So let's see. Yeah, I will. Let's set that up real quick. All righty. All right, everyone. You put in, and this coupon is not going to work forever. So I'm going to give you, let's see, today's Thursday. I give you one week to use this coupon. You got one week. And after that, it's going to go down. It's going to be like 20%. 10%. So use coupon code no limits. I'll put it in the chat. And that will give you 30% off of the on demand, the mentorship, and the monthly payment for the mentorship if you want to go in that direction. And everyone tell Esther thank you. And now I'm going to see you all sign up. There's 47 people in here right now. I'm going to see 47 people signed up. Oh, yeah. You know, and if you just want like a nice calming experience, you could always just buy the on demand just to watch Esther paint. It's almost like meditation. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Tessa has an unrelated question. What time tomorrow do we need our DTIYs entries turned in? Uh, so you, you can, as long as you submit it before, uh, before midnight, then you're good to go. Because uh, I think on the next day, I'm, uh, all right, I'm going to start picking the, the winners. And for the people that don't know, what are you talking about? Oh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> I, sorry. So I started a challenge on my Instagram. Uh, it's called Draw Disney or Style. So uh, I noticed that a lot of people like the the lion uh, with roses that I did. So I I wanted to make a Draw Disney or Style of that lion. And so far, I'm loving all of the entries they're just it's just amazing to see different 
types of composition and uh, different choices that people took, like different approaches for the painting. They look pretty good. Okay, just seeing what you've done in like a couple of hours, I could work on this for a month and oh. not not get that. <laughs> oh my God, no, trust me, like this is a, uh, it's so relaxing for me that I just, I go extremely slow. I just like the, to enjoy the process, you know, you know, painting each part like little by little. Yeah, Ebony says that she uh, started following you because of your rose lion. Oh, nice. Thank you. So it's epic. I'm glad you like it. And another question, what were your influences for it? Um, Honestly, that, that was a, so the first idea was a bit abstract. It was just a, an image that came into my mind. Like I, I just started to like this image of a lion and roses couldn't get out of my, my head. Like the concept that, that I first, uh, the first pop out of my mind was completely different from the original result, uh, the final result. So it started off as like an, like a, a feeling and then I wanted to put that feeling on the paper and I started to like try to bring that to life little by little. There we go. I'm going to start erasing the, the lines it's bothering me a little bit. I have to say, even your little thumbnail sketch, your speed sketch you did, oh. uh, I think that's better than I paint, so good job. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I think that. That yeah, looks that's... finished down there. I'd call that finished. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that, that's what my husband said. I mean, <laughs> he thought he was, that was the finished version, but I said, no, that's just the rough, like the, the layers of brush strokes, they're completely messed up so that was just very spontaneous the the the, the rough sketch if there's any questions that i missed uh anywhere just shout them back out if anybody's got anything Oh, there's a good one. Sarah asks, uh, what's your all-time favorite artwork you ever did? Wow, I don't, wow, that's a hard one. I, the thing is that I, I like everything that I do. Like, sometimes I, I'll feel a little bit frustrated with it, but I try to um, have as much fun as possible. So that, it would, I think it would be hard for me to tell like my ultimate favorite. But I think that my favorite ones are uh, the ones that I have, like I said, I have fun with most, most of them, so I'm not sure. But I would say that the Lion and Roses one to me was the one that really, because you know, it has a uh, impactful meaning to me, like a personal one, so. To me, the execution of that piece was just 
uh, amazing, you know, I just, it was completely, uh, it was very impulsive, like I just wanted to throw the colors into the canvas, like, you know, I did all the, you know, I tried to plan the composition first and everything, but I tried to be as expressive as possible of my feelings, and that was, uh, it was really cool, like I, like I said, to me, painting is like therapy, it feels, it makes me feel very relaxed. What are your favorite animal movies? Favorite animal movies? Uh, the Lion King is definitely one of them. Um, Zootopia, that's awesome, but one of my favorites. Uh, Tarzan, I know Tarzan is a human, but I just love the gorilla designs in there. Like, it's just amazing. Yeah, those gorillas and the, those are awesome character design yes like uh, i think that tarzan was one of the first movies that i watched that they officially made me fall in love for uh for art like uh, i just look at the tv and i was like oh my god i want to do that like that's definitely i don't know what that is i have no idea uh if you know there if there's a, like a job to do character design i i didn't know back then but uh Tarzan was one of those movies, definitely. Yeah, I love uh, the character design in Secret Life of Pets. Oh my god, that one is cute. I yeah, like how... The bunny. <laughs> the bunny's awesome. I love the bunny. His voice is hilarious. I think it, they did a really good job when it comes to exaggerating the shapes and everything else. It's just... Uh, you know, it's just amazing. I really like it. There's that one. Uh, it's called Sing. That one is a good one. Yeah, Sing is good. I, yeah. I didn't actually think it was going to be good. And then I watched it with my daughter and it's like, that's a really yeah. good movie. It's funny. Yeah, true. And I also like the theme of the story. You know, everybody tried to pursue their dreams. It's just, uh, I, I like uh, mo movies that have that type of storytelling. Oh. But there are more movies with animals that I love. I just uh, can't remember right now. Oh yes, there is a uh, uh, the Lady and the Tramp. That one I mm -hmm. I love to watch that movie like all the time. Really good. What would you have become if you did not become an artist? Hmm. I would definitely do something that is animal related like i would probably be a vet or a biologist i also wanted to become a tennis player like i i played tennis for like more than 13 14 years and uh it came to a point that i had to pick between going to art school or you know playing tennis and i chose to do art like to me, that's just my ultimate passion. Yeah, it was kind of the same way. I was in baseball for a long time and I quit to go to art school. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was just, yeah, I think that you kind of feel like a sort of relief because you realize that that's not what you want, you know, especially if you, you know, like your parents want you to do something like, my, like, how can you say my parents, they always supported me in art, uh, but they also, uh, they wanted me to play in sports because my dad is also, uh, he plays sports as well, and, uh, but, but like that became like his career, but that, I, I kind of like I, I I really like playing tennis, but I I don't think I had all of the that determination to become like uh a, you know a big uh 
a well-known tennis player. So I, I real and also realized I, I spent way more time drawing than playing tennis. Like sometimes I would just, whenever I was, uh, my coach was teaching us, I would sometimes stop and draw on the floor. Like, you know, those uh, uh, tennis fields that are made of, uh, I forgot the material, it's like a, a red type of dirt thing. Sometimes I would just like draw with my foot in there and- uh, Okay, the, the clay? Yeah, the clay, yeah. And that's when I realized, yeah, I, I want to I, I be an artist, like, because I'm thinking about that, like, all the time, you know. Do you ever give up on an artwork? Like, you know, it's just not going to work out, or do you always push through? Uh, uh, I push it through, like, 95% of the time. If I decide to give up is because like, you know, I procrastinated for way too long, but that, that's rare to happen. And I, and, and I start to realize that because uh, a lot of time already passed by, my skills are no longer the same. And, uh, you know, and I start to notice like, uh, I don't really like this composition. I have to start over again. And uh, I, I start having better ideas. So I just, I just let it go. But like I said, that doesn't, that doesn't happen like very often. It's just, oh, once in a while, because I, I like to finish uh, the stuff that I start most of the time. Yeah, I wish I had the drive to finish like everything I started but I have so many projects that I've started oh. I think that yeah it kind of goes with the the territory of 3D though it's like you know you might start blocking something out and then I get distracted a little bit ADD yeah, yeah I, I completely understand but that yeah that's something like it it takes some time you know for you to resist to not start a new project oh yeah and then uh <laughs> And then be like, oh, okay, let me keep on track of this. And uh, that's just, there's some times that I just don't want to continue a painting because I'm just like, ah, I'm just tired of painting this like all day, all night. And uh, But I always push it through and uh, it's good. <laughs> Spice, are you still here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so how many projects have you started and not finished? Zero. I finished <laughs> all my projects. Awesome. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I started, um, I mean, I don't know if there's a number, but, um, you know, quite a few that they're just like halfway done. And that's, that's not something that I hang over myself at all. I mean, yeah. especially if it's like, um, personal work, you know, um, I've, I've finished enough projects to where I don't let that hang over my head, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I just let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I kind of use it like a, I mean, every time, even if you don't finish something, you, you're still going to learn from it. So it's like, oh, uh, yes. uh -huh. you know, just start bashing something out and uh, especially like starting out if you're a new student or even if you're starting out in the industry in any industry, uh, just start things and don't worry about uh, finishing it. Um, and you can always, you, know, you can always come back to it. That's the good thing about digital. Is, oh, uh, yes. <laughs> it's not, it's not taking up space in your room, you know. Uh huh. You don't have like a huge canvas sitting in the corner of your room. And you don't have to worry about having like all these burn parties that people have. I still don't understand that. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Amanda's got a question. Do you have any advice for learning and understanding values and how to use, identify, or how to identify when and where to use them? Uh, so I recommend like just study a lot from reference. And also you can go as, as far as doing the color picking, you know, if you need to understand the relationship between colors and you know, what's going on in the 
the where the shadow family is and where the light family is you know just totally go for it like that's what i what i that's actually what i still do but keep in mind if you're going to color pip you you always have to make sure that you're, you're not just color picking just so you can get the work done like oh okay let me just put it in here and that's it no you have to understand the process like because in the picture you're gonna notice that the, you're gonna have a, like a lot of pixels and each pixel is going to have a different color in this in the same area you see sometimes like i'm going to get a pink here that is a bit desaturated you know like right here in this shadow so you always have to keep that in mind that uh you're going to eventually develop your visual library and uh and then learning values uh, is going to become 10 times easier. But very importantly, always make sure that you create that division between shadow and light because you don't want to make your brightest area in the shadow family as bright as the, the the light, you know, the light family. Otherwise, it, you're gonna make your drawing look very. Uh, it's going to start to look kind of flat. So always keep that in mind. And if you always uh, follow these rules, I think that, you know, you can come up with different ways to work on the composition of your paintings. You know. No, that's my favorite part. I just work on the little pieces of hair and I start refining everything pretty much. I think we'll probably go for Let's give it like 15 more minutes and we'll start wrapping it up. Okay. No pressure. Oh, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And everyone in here wanna see you in this mentorship, everyone. I see, I see all you people. Uh, Cherry's got a, a question. Are you planning to blend the yellow and the red together at some point for the rim light or just leave it as is? Uh, you mean like merge the layers or? And I mean actually like blending the colors to each other. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm still gonna work on that a little bit. That's just like a, a placeholder just so I uh, get an idea of what the colors look like and I'm gonna refine that. And Tessa, the one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, I believe uh, we're starting, aren't we, 
we're starting on the 22nd of February um, for one-on-one. Um, and the first week uh, is going to be an interview uh, with each student and Esther. And she'll go through your strengths and weaknesses, what you want to work on uh, type yeah. thing. Um, and Esther, if you want to tell them a little bit more about your process for that. Okay, so uh, first, I usually meet with my students. I ask them for to set up a, a Discord uh, account because uh, we're going to do most of our communications in there. I'm going to ask you what are going to be like, what are your goals uh, uh, as an artist? Like, do you want to be a concept artist or something like that? And from there, I'm going to guide you through like the things that you should consider, you know, uh, studying. Like you're going to follow up with the with the pipeline, but, uh, but also I'm going to give you extra assignments uh, to in order to achieve what you want to in your work. So let's say if you're struggling, for example, you're going to study the, the anatomy of a lion as a whole, but like from all the body parts are struggling to draw paws so i'm going to ask you to draw paws more often than the other body parts or i'm going to give you other extra exercises let's say if you're struggling with the gesture drawing you know i'm going to give you another other types of exercises that they're going to help you to understand the line weight and how you can enhance your work by keeping things like you know simpler instead of like focusing on a, too much on the details. Yeah, and keep in mind, if you sign up now for the mentorship, uh, you immediately get access to all the videos. Um, so you can start watching those now. Because um, if you wait until the end uh, to get access, then you're gonna be competing with yourself to have Esther's time and watch videos at the same time. But if you grab them now, you can watch all the videos ahead of time and then know what you wanna work on. So yeah, that, can, that can help quite a bit. Yeah, that helps a lot because uh, it's going to be, you're gonna be doing a lot of work, you know, and uh, you gotta make sure that you put that quality time into the assignment. And doing work in the industry, do they expect you to do work quickly or do they give you a lot of time to work? For example, how many weeks would they give you for conceptual art? It really depends on the client because, uh, for example, that was uh, like, I'm going to give an example of when I was working for advertisement for this company called Life Farm Studios. Uh, I work for the Brazilian studio. And uh, for you have to do a lot of, because it's advertisement, you have to do a lot of uh, concept art and you have to do it like really fast. Sometimes they, they tell you, hey, we need you to do this. Like it's, it's 3 p.m. and we need you to do like tons of like, you know, concepts uh, for 6 p.m., I don't know. And uh, you have to think, uh, you have to think really fast in an efficient way so you don't take too long to accomplish it. You know, but there are other clients that you know they 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 just tell to take your to take your time, you know, to work on it. Uh, for example, there was there was this one year project that I did for Disney, and that one, uh, you know, we we're not so much in a rush because it was uh, a one year project. So every month I had a task to, to work on, like it would ask me to like oh work on this color palette or. Uh, the environment design for this and that, and uh, I would just uh, take my time for that in between uh, working and also they would give me the feedbacks and things like that. Yeah, 
Yeah, I had a client years ago that uh, literally stood over my shoulder um, virtually, what? basically uh, through Teams, um, and watch me work and tell me like where to position stuff. But I was like wow. completely starting out and, you know, I like couldn't afford to turn down the project at that point. But uh, if you ever get yourself in that position, just quit. Oh it's not God. worth it. <laughs> oh my God. That was like yeah, the let's... worst client. And he still, this wow. like, this like, uh, I think thir 14 years later, he still contacts me. He's like, wow. can, can, can I get you? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> never work oh with my God. yeah i don't like i have some clients that they just don't i don't know they're really disorganized and i just avoid getting back to working for them but uh it's just terrible yeah it's nice when you can get into a position where you can turn down work yes until, until you get to that point it it's uh it can be pretty rough sometimes yeah, that's true because you you know at, the, at first you never know when work is gonna come, but once you have that confidence that you know, I, I know work is gonna come. You know, I can turn down this opportunity that I know that they're gonna they're gonna come back. You know, if they like my work, I'm not gonna worry about it. You know, if I tell them, hey, I'm busy, can you wait a few more months? And you know, mm -hmm. most of them they wait if they really wanna work with you, they do. You know? Oh yeah, and clients yeah. definitely they'll come back. And you'll get a it, word of mouth is really strange how it works. Uh, in, oh yeah. In in this whole like art industry, like if you're good, you're good to your clients, um, and they'll come back, and other people will start coming out of the woodwork. And definitely, like networking is the biggest thing. Like, I'd say like network your ass off. Yes meet everyone yeah that's very important sometimes you, you never know you're gonna have uh, someone who enjoy working with you and they're going to uh, recommend you to an awesome studio you know that happened to me like tons of times like i would never imagine like oh that that person tells me that you're great at doing this type of job and we want you to do it and, uh, no it's just amazing just make sure that you always do a great job like doesn't matter if you're just getting started, always put your best because you never know when, like, you know, the, your dream opportunity is going to come up. Yeah, like the opposite can happen too. If you uh, don't put in like your full effort into something and it shows, then uh, word will get around. That, oh, yes. Like, it happens just the opposite way too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Sky asking the advice on getting started on networking, social media. <laughs> like, I I use the hell out of LinkedIn. Like I know oh, Spicer uses good. it too. Oh it's yeah, a, it is amazing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Even though LinkedIn tells you not to befriend people you don't know, befriend <laughs> everyone you don't know. Yes. Go in there, find art directors at places you want to work. Find don't don't really worry about the the smaller artists at places unless you just want to have friends. But if you want to get in at places, find the art directors, find the leads, find the seniors, anybody that you can to get your foot in the door and start talking to them. Just get to know them. And you don't have to tell them, like, don't start out the conversation with, uh, uh, could you get me a job at Blizzard? <laughs> like, they don't know you. They're going to cut you off right there. Yeah. That is true. And then it's going to come to a point that you don't have to add these people because they're, they're just going to come to you, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's just, but, you know, you got to have a grounded foundation, you know, and start working on your social media, make sure that you're always updating it. Because, you know, if you stop sharing for a while, then, you know, people are going to stop to contact you and, and work as well. So always make sure that you're always active. Yeah, and you're, I mean, the more you post on social media, um, you know, art, non-art, 
talking with people, conversing with people, your social media grows itself. Mm-hmm. Like it will just continuously yes. grow as long as you continuously use it. Yes, that's true. You know, you're going to find that fine line between like what you like and what your public like. And it's going to come point that you don't have to struggle that much with, uh, you know, uh, at first, how can you say to, because it comes to a point that, you know, you, you cannot be worrying about followers all the time. You just have to enjoy what you do. And I think that's what matters the most, you know, and eventually, the, you know, the followers are going to come with time, you know. Uh, Cherry's asking, what would you recommend you'd say to connect or get first acquainted with people in the art industry? Uh, wait, repeat that question again, sorry. Uh, what would you recommend you'd say to connect or get first acquainted with those people in the art in- industry? He's talking about like LinkedIn or social media, just like connecting with people. Oh, sorry, repeat the question again. I'm just, <laughs> oh. Just uh, like, how would you introduce yourself to people online? Um, uh, I, think, I think I kind of like run into that quite a bit. It's like yeah. getting a conversation started with people. Yeah, um, it's good to like add, like, you know, if you're going to add them on social media, for example, your favorite artists and you want to connect with them to get a chance in the industry, I recommend it to like, you know, do, try to be as genuine as possible. Don't just do it because, oh, well, you will potentially give me work in the future. You know what I mean? But like, try to make genuine connections and, you know, like, uh, try to show appreciation for their work, you know, and explain why you admire their work and they will, you know, and they will connect with you and eventually they're going to start to uh, give you, uh, you know, opportunities in the industry. There are some there's quite a few people in the industry that, you know, I added them on social media. And because of the, you know, at first I just added them because I admired their work. I wasn't looking, you know, for work, but that was a consequence of my, of my choices. They ended up giving me jobs uh, in the industry. Like, hey, I like your work. I have a friend in Tata studio and, uh, you, you know, you can just go ahead and tell them that. I told you to contact them and they're going to give you the job, you know, and uh, that's just, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, and uh, Mena asks, um, you know, do directors ever find it annoying if you reach out to them uh, to get to know them better, especially if you're a complete stranger? Uh, that's one of their concerns. I'd say, like, mm. you know, for me, whenever, if I connect with, like, an art director or creative director or something, um, like kind of start a conversation with them don't just be like uh you know i want to connect to you just because you're a director like start something be like uh look them up like find out um what kind of work they've done what they worked on and start a conversation about that um no like unless they're just like a total jerk like they're they're not gonna just go like uh you know get away from me um as long as you're like you said as long as you're genuine tell them like where you're coming from where you've been like uh if you're a student starting out um don't be like uh you know don't just start out with like how do i become you like you know like ask them genuine questions like uh you know like oh yeah how do you uh get started or what what would you recommend getting started in the industry type thing tell them that you're a student um tell them that you're just starting out um i've had a ton of students reach out to me over the years and um as long as they you know like tell me some kind of story or something and they're not just like give me a job <laughs> then uh yeah. then i'll i'll totally answer any questions that they have And I've uh, personally mentored um, several uh, students just, you know, just helping them out over the years, uh, get started in the industry. And I mean, it's just, just be yourself and don't, uh, don't try to gain anything out of it. Just kind of like you're meeting a friend for the first time. Just treat them like, uh, you know, like a normal stranger. It's yeah. like, how would you start up a conversation with a stranger in real life, like not on the internet? 
you wouldn't go uh, like slide into someone's DMs. Like, <laughs> <laughs> don't want to like be a creep oh, yeah. or anything. Oh uh-huh, <clears throat> yes. Be who you would be in real life, because people tend to be somebody different online. The art mongoose. I heard if you do amazing work, do it always on time and are likable and easy to work with, jobs will compete for you. But if you have at least two out of those three things, you can at least get jobs. Like charismatic person with great work, people will be patient with you. Or places will hire someone hard to get along with if they do amazing work always on time if you're punctual reliable and nice your work can just be pretty good and people will hire you have you seen this i would say like i personally stay away from people who are assholes Mm -hmm. like i i do not i don't care how good you are um like i've i've been a lead for many years uh, at a few places and you know hiring i don't care how good you are if you're an asshole you're not getting the job. Mm. So yeah, don't be that person. Some places will hire you just for that. And I've worked with people that are like that. But yeah, if I'm in charge of the hiring, I don't do that. Like, uh, but yeah, the as far as your other things, um, totally. But like actresses and actors and stuff, uh, that goes for them a lot. Like if they're really good, then they can be like the ultimate diva. But yeah. um yeah, in the art industry, your name will get around for uh, yes, being a jerk. True. Like, and then you'll get less and less work. And these days, people get canceled for shit too. So you got to be careful about that. Yeah, I always, ha- always have to be nice because, like you said, uh, maybe you know you might get the opportunity of your life, but someone told that person that is hiring you that you know you're not very polite and they will probably you know not consider to hire you you know all right esther i could sit here and watch you paint all night but i think we might have to end it uh, okay no problem <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm i'm, I'm just <laughs> to the point where i just i'm going like to really slow i just really enjoy painting yeah so carla for for your answer uh we're 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 about done (laughs) (laughs) but um yeah um so for once again esther's class uh the art of animal illustration it is not only illustration you can go over anything 2d related um esther is an amazing instructor uh, she will level you up more than you can even imagine. Um, yeah, and you can get 30% off of her course um, on XMB Academy right now with a coupon code no limits. Vanessa. Uh, it'll also work on the on demand. It will also work on the monthly um, and the actual uh, one-on-one sessions starts February 22nd. Uh, Coupon is only going to work for a week. So by next Friday, use it or lose it. Um, But yeah, you got anything? Yeah, mm-hmm. I just I just wanted to mention that also, uh, as I said before, there is like a little gift that I wanted to give you guys for joining. Oh the yeah, class. the gift. The, the webinar. And I for the first time, I'm going to give you all my brush pack. So you're going to have wow. all the brushes that I use for all of my work. And, uh, the, uh, and then later on, it's going to be sent to, to you for everyone who has watched it. Oh, that is amazing. 
So how many brushes you got in there? You got you got quite a few. Yeah, yeah. You said the, like 30? Mm, yeah. No, 20. Yeah, but, yeah, before actually let me just explain something real quick. So mm -hmm. the, the type of brushes that I have for the brush pack is the two presets. And the difference between the two presets and the brush presets is that the two presets they they already have uh you know, like when you set up your brush to have like texture, you know, all of these features here, when you have the two presets, they're all going to be saved up. So, uh, and that's the complete opposite of the regular brushes, which are the, you know, the default ones that you find in here. Because if you pick a random brush here, it's going to, it's not going to have uh, the settings uh, saved, you know. And so like that, those are the perks if you, you know, once you start using my brush back. And yeah, there's also, it comes also with uh, different smudge tools here. And uh, eraser as well, there's different styles right here. And that's it. Wow, that is, that's an awesome gift. Um, yeah, so I will send this brush back in the email that I send to everyone after this, everyone that's watched, everyone that will watch will get this um, in their email. I'll send you a link to download the brushes. Uh, you get the coupon in your email and a link to her course on demand and the mentorship. So uh, yeah, I think we are done. Thank oh, you yeah. <laughs> everybody. Especially the people that stayed the entire time. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I know this yeah. went kind of long, but I hope you really learned something. I know I learned something. I mean, just. I'm glad. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I literally could just sit here and watch you paint all night. So we'll just keep going. You got eight hours in you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll probably stay here longer after this. I just really. Well, if you if yeah. you end up like uh, yeah, once uh, you finish this, um, get it where you want it. Um, I'll post it on uh, on the course as well. So. Oh okay, all right. Yeah. Cool. Oh uh, good. Thank you very much, and thank you, Spicer, for being here. Oh yeah. You know everybody loves your voice. Oh yeah. <laughs> you got that radio voice. Thank you again for coming to XMD webinar oh with Esther Consasau and Michael Dunham. Oh my god, that was awesome. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I still got, I, I got to record your voice for like an intro. Like yes, just radio definitely. intro for everything. Yes. All right, so we're gonna Sounds do that. Wonderful. We're gonna do that this weekend, okay? Sounds great. <laughs> and the soundboard. <laughs> oh man. You, you like the uh, the guy from uh, uh, what is that? NBA Jam. Yeah, can't buy a bucket. <laughs> He's on fire. He's on fire. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. And thank you very much, Esther. You are amazing as always. Thank you. And I still expect every single person in here to join the mentorship or at least by the on demand. If you don't, then uh, Spicer is going to show up at your door because that's what he does. That's why I hired him. <laughs> oh, yeah. So everybody have a good night. Uh, good night, everyone. <laughs>